Well, good morning, church family. All right, good night. If I can't preach after that, I'm in trouble, okay? Amen, amen. Uh, Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, as we continue our walk through Paul's letter to Timothy. You hold your spot there. I'm going to begin with an introduction uh, on Paul's first missionary journey. He was traveling through the region of Galatia, and he came to a small country village of Lystra, not knowing how eventful this little small town would be. This is where Paul will heal a man who had never walked a day in his life. This is where Paul would be worshipped by town folk who worshiped Paul and Barnabas as Zeus and Hermes. This is is where Paul would be stoned, discarded outside the city, thought to be dead, but by God's grace, broken bones will mend and gashes will scar over. But this is also where Paul will meet a young 18-year-old Timothy, and he will get saved and find a spiritual father in Paul. Even in Paul's sufferings, Timothy Timothy saw a truth in Paul that his soul longed for. Years later, Paul would come back through Lystra and would ask Timothy to join his missionary journeys. Now, can you imagine the consideration of this? Okay, your introduction is Paul being stoned. He walks with a limp. His back is littered with scars from the numerous beatings, scars that he will later call the marks of Jesus. He's been shipwrecked, imprisoned. Everywhere he goes, there's always opposition. Hey, Timothy. You want to join with me on my journeys? And Timothy goes. Eyes wide open, Timothy goes with Paul. Why? Because what he sees in Paul is that the gospel is worth it. Telling others who have not ever heard is worth it. Strengthening churches is worth it. Battling false teachers is worth it. Spending your life for the kingdom of God is worth it because Jesus is worth it. And Timothy will become Paul's most trusted partner in the ministry, an extension of himself, preaching the gospel, (laughs) planting churches, helping shepherd churches through difficult situations, rooting out false teaching. Timothy will be who Paul begs for to come to his side when he knows that his time is short. And Timothy will be faithful until the very end, rarely taking the limelight, but walking through the same difficulties as Paul. You know, we often don't think too much about Timothy But as we will see in today's text, Paul has charged Timothy with a monumental task of addressing the false teachers in Ephesus, but Paul is also going to speak to Timothy personally, encouraging him, reassuring him. So let's read God's word together. Now, for our purposes today, our text is 11 through 16, but I need to call your attention to verses 1 and 8 again from last week. So let me start with verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says in latter times that some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, skip down to verse 8. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. All right, now our passage today, 11 through 16. 
Paul is writing to Timothy, prescribe and teach these things. <clears throat> Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself as an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, being absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both to yourself and for those who hear you. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, as we have come into your presence this morning as your people, the living temple, what an honor and privilege it is, God, for us to worship together, for us to come before your throne in prayer, and for us to read your word. Father, we pray that you would instruct our hearts and our lives to pay attention to the incredible things that are going on around us. But Father, for us never to forget that it is through your power and your strength that we are to walk in this difficult world, giving you praise and glory and honor. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> all right, so Daniel did an excellent job reminding us last week that the issues that are going on in the churches here in Ephesus aren't simply false teachers with their bad doctrine. No, there is a power source that is behind what is going on. Spiritual warfare, rulers, principalities, forces of evil. Now, I know in the, to our Western ears we hear that and we say, well, how unsophisticated. Our culture has bought into a naturalistic worldview where we think everything has a natural cause and therefore we can fix it. We say, ah, that's just a psychological or social problem. Let's not call that evil. Let's call that a dysfunction. And we can fix that with some medicine or changing of the environment. And yes, all of those factors are true. But the Bible screams, you are also ignoring that there is a whole spiritual reality that is going on. That there are causes beyond the physical and the psychological. There are moral causes and there are spiritual causes. So you see it back in 4 verse 1, right? That behind the false teachers that so many are following and paying attention to, 4.1, he says, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Oh my goodness, pastor. Are you now saying that all of those false teachers are demon-possessed and that demons are just controlling their mouths? No. Listen, it's crazy how we just jump from one extreme to the other. Let me give an illustration to you from John White. Did you know that you can go and open up a piano and speak and the notes that are attuned to your voice, those notes will vibrate. Those strings that are attuned to your will vibrate. Now hold on to that idea. Do you also know that the name devil, diabolos, means liar or slanderer? The most common form of spiritual warfare is not demon possession. No, it's evil forces lying and slandering. That's exactly what happened in the garden. See again in 4.1, deceitful spirits, doctrines of demons. Like speaking over a piano, spiritual forces speak lies. And your thought patterns perpetuate them. And they know that you are attuned to certain weaknesses. 
See, the devil makes a flawed person worse. So I go into all of that because in our situation, we have false teachers who have risen up within the church. They have a pretty wide following. And we've talked about their false doctrine. But equally important, these teachers themselves are selfish, greedy, legalistic, impatient, prideful. And their culture of those characteristics has started to spread through the church, taking root. And Paul is writing to Timothy and telling him what to do about it. And he's just reminded Timothy, there's spiritual warfare going on behind all of this. Oh yeah, spiritual warfare behind it? Well, does that mean Timothy's supposed to call everyone together and cast out the demons? Suddenly become a magician and say all the right words, in the name of Jesus, be gone. No, that's not what he does. He gives instructions. So I want you to listen to me in this context. But real quickly, what I also want you to understand, yes, we are talking about the church but I also want you to listen about your home. And I want you to listen in your workplace, okay? Because your home is under attack with the same lies. And so are the people that you encounter at work. So what is the instruction into this spiritual warfare? Verse 11, Timothy, prescribe and teach these things things. Now, what are the these things? That's back from verse 8. Church, that we are to discipline ourselves to godliness. This is a trustworthy statement. Discipline yourself to godliness. Timothy, prescribe this. Now, unfortunately, the word prescribe doesn't capture the authoritative flavor that the Greek word has there. Okay? It's a little more like command with authority, to charge. Timothy, command the people of God and teach them to discipline themselves to godliness. Now, I'm, I'm such a big football fan, all right, that I don't just watch the games. I listen to all the sports talk leading up to the games, and then all the sports talk after the games. Now, understandably, my wife finds this entirely too much, right? But on, oh, oh, all the amens come out then, all right? All right, so you gave me amens there. You better, you better keep it up throughout the rest of the sermon then. Now, you watch these sports talk shows, and inevitably, they put a guy on there who's never played the game. But they're on there because they're funny, and they have these big, audacious opinions, okay? These guys are called armchair quarterbacks, all right? They are couch potatoes who give grandiose ideas about how easy the game is from afar, but they're not actually in the gym. They don't have a 300 pound man trying to tear their head off. They don't know what it's like to be in the game. Beloved, how foolish are we if we think we can go straight from the couch into the game? You say, what game are you talking about? The fact that this, there is spiritual warfare that is raging on around us all the time. You know in Ephesians chapter 6 when uh, Paul is telling us to put on God's armor, the Greek verb there is, is the past tense, a finished action, meaning you put on the armor before you get in the battle. Okay? That is, you don't look up and see an arrow flying at you and go, now, now where did I put that shield? Okay? That's not how you fight. Okay? And that is what he's saying here. Timothy, charge the people of God 
to go to the gym of godly discipline because there's a spiritual battle that is raging on around you all the time. Now, pastor, tell me plainly what some of these godly disciplines are that I need in my life. Let me ask you, do you know how the enemy attacks you? Do you know how the enemy attacks your family? What does God's word say about that? What are the promises of God that correct the lies of the enemy? Memorize those verses. Have them readily at your disposal. Let me give you an example. Every day, each of us is tempted with patience, right? You encounter someone and you immediately want to judge them and in your mind you say things like, this person is so stupid. They are nothing more than an obstacle in my day. If they would get out of the way, you don't view them as a person. You're like, just get it together and get out of here. Now, do you struggle with this? All right, if you don't, I need to talk to you about what God's word says about lying, all right? (laughs) Of course we do, right? We all do. Now, are we going to lose that skirmish? Give the enemy a foothold? Or are we going to apply with God's word in our heart? For example, from James 1, 19, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. God, okay? Beloved, I know you're busy, but you must discipline yourself to godliness. There's too much at stake in our church and in your home and in our community. Look again at verse 13. Remember Paul to Timothy, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture to exhortation and teaching. Now, what are we talking about again? Spiritual warfare. Rooting out a culture of lies believed within the church that has become toxic. Timothy, give special attention to the public reading of God's word and to preaching it and teaching it. Huh. Huh. You mean preaching God's word is how you fight spiritual battles within the church? Church family, listen to me. You must demand this. Everywhere you go, students, as you leave here, as you move on in life, you must demand, okay? You must not have an appetite for anything else Because too much is at stake. A preacher's job is to read God's word, to explain it, to apply it, and to make it compelling. So listen carefully. I I am not for boring seminary style lectures, just drawn out people that talk too long. God's word is alive, and there is a spiritual battle raging on in the lives of our children, in our family, and in our community. It must be engaging. It must be applicable. But oh, how our culture has substituted engaging, funny, applicable, and yet forgotten that it is supposed to be birthed out of God's word. It must be built on the foundation of God's word. Listen, a funny story or a wouldn't it be nice life lesson is not a biblical sermon, okay? And it will not allow you to stand on the day when trials come and when demons attack. 
Paul is not mincing words here. Look, again, he says it in verse 16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation, both for yourself and for those who hear you. That is the means, the primary means that God has given for salvation and for spiritual warfare within the church and within your home is the word of God. All right, so you can see how everything we've said so far lines up. Timothy, charge the people to discipline themselves to godliness and preach it, buddy, right? Give it to them. But there's another important thread that that Paul weaves through here, and he presses Timothy, that Timothy himself must show to be a godly example in his own character. Look at verse 12. In speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe All right, so you know that hypocritical moment as a parent when you are caught doing the opposite of what you've been teaching your children to do? And you have to reply, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, that's pretty shameful, right? Paul wants none of that. Timothy, you must show yourself to bear the fruit of the gospel. Recall, the false teachers, they don't simply have a legalistic inward gospel. It also shows up in their character. Throughout the letter, we learn that they are selfish and greedy and legalistic and prideful and biting. A false gospel produces bad fruit. Okay? A false gospel produces bad fruit. Why? Because it's a reflection of the God, little g, that it represents. It's a reflection of who's behind that teaching, deceitful spirits and demons. You see, there is a direct line between doctrine and the fruit of character produced. And so it must be true for the true gospel also. Timothy, you must abide in Christ and show Christ's character. Whereas they are selfish, you must be sacrificial. Whereas they are biting and legalistic, you must be loving and filled with joy. Whereas they are greedy, you must be generous. Whereas they are always pridefully jockeying to get to the top and show themselves better for position, you must be like Jesus, a servant. You must be gracious and thankful and patient and holy. And it must show up in your speech and in your conduct and in your faith. And as people watch you and as they interact with you, Because you reflect the God who saved you. Timothy, this is the way that you change culture that is being poisoned by lies from the evil one who is a liar. And there is no shortcut for this. There is no shortcut. Yes, of course, Timothy is supposed to remove the false teacher if he rears his ugly head. But don't you see that their lies have infiltrated the culture? And that can only be uprooted by the truth of the gospel and time for people to see and to examine the fruit of the real gospel. This is why a few weeks ago, as we walked through the office of overseer and the office of deacon, what was paramount? What was insisted upon by the scripture? That character matters. Beloved, remember I told you to hold in the back of your mind the application that yes, we're talking about the church, but also your home and also your workplace. Do you know what the number one indicator of if a child is gonna love and follow Jesus, you know what the number one indicator is? Their parents. 
And dads are the highest, even higher than moms. But it's not just any parents, because your children are watching. They see the real you behind closed doors, and they interact with your character long before they understand your theology. You are the first picture of God that they see. Now, isn't that heavy? But would you want it any other way? Dads? Would you want it any other way? Finally, with the little time that I have left, I want you to see the way that Paul personally encourages Timothy. Now, from the bits that we can piece together, Timothy, by personality, is a little on the timid side. Okay, so on the spectrum of personalities, you have those who are naturally bold like lions, and they regularly struggle with pride. And then you have those that are reserved or timid, and they struggle with courage. Well, Timothy is on this side, a little more reserved or timid. And Paul knows this. So as he writes to him, you can see that there are these tender moments where Paul is calling Timothy forward. Look at verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness. And again in verse 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed upon you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Now, both of these statements, Paul is aiming at Timothy's heart. And he's telling him to block out the lies of the enemy. The first lie of the enemy is the fear of man. You see, Timothy is in his late 30s, but to Jewish custom, that is still a young man. And he's susceptible to elders questioning him and saying, Who is this young pup? And who does he think he is, that he can speak to us that way? He knows nothing. And the second lie is fear of inadequacy for the task. Who am I, Timothy says inward. Who am I to lead the church, to fight spiritual battles, to uproot false teachers? I am not equipped for this. I am not Paul. Everyone wants me to be Paul, but I'm not. I'm half the man that he is. And to this, Paul charges Timothy, calls him forward. Let no one look down on your youthfulness. Do not give them an inch of space to pretend like they are better than you because of your age. Do not fear man. You prove to be a man of Christ do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. Timothy, God has called you. I want you to look back in your life and I want you to remember the fact that God has worked in you personally. Has God been faithful in the past? Then he will be again in this situation. And God has led you here. Do not shrink back from this moment. Yes, it feels overwhelming and that you are not equipped. But listen, that is in your strength. And God is with you. Now, isn't this encouraging? Amen. Can I tell you personally, right? I needed this tender call from God's word this week, right? That reassurance that God has called me to be the pastor of this church. And, and he has called me to be the husband to my wife and, and the father to my children in my home. And I know all across this room that many of you right now, you face situations where you fear man and you fear your own inadequacy. And what does the devil do? He plays that over and over and over again. And so let me close by charging you that you are a child 
of the maker of heaven and earth. And that Jesus calls you his own. He calls you his own. Do not fear man. And the task that he has put in front of you at work, in your marriage, with your kids, Christian, he has called you to this. And yes, it feels enormous and it feels frightening, but that is in your own strength. Christ is with you. Christ is with you, and he will equip you for the task. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, we believe this truth from your word. We believe it by faith. Father, I know all across this room that, that uh, your children are in the midst of battles that um, rage on around us. And, and Father, how, how often we feel ill-equipped. Father, how, how often we get overwhelmed with, with the fear of our own inadequacies and with the fear of man's approval. God, I pray that your word would take root and that we as your sons and daughters would, would take up your word, would put on your armor, would know your promises. God, that we would discipline ourselves to godliness, that we would get in the gem of discipline to godliness, that we would memorize your word and that we would stop believing the lies of the enemy, but we would have your word at our disposal to reply immediately, immediately to demons and their deceitful thoughts and to even our own fluttering heart with the truth of your word the truth of your word. Father, I pray that we as a church are a church that's built upon your word, shining the truth of your light into the community that this community knows that if there is one place that they can come and hear truth, that is at this church and at our sister churches who love your word, God. Help us to stand strong and firm. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church family, as the praise team comes to lead us in one final song, um, you are invited, encouraged to respond. However, the Spirit of God has prompted you this morning that you would respond in faithfulness, that you can stand to your feet, that you can sing, sing in faith. If the Spirit of God has stirred you, you might need to, to stay seated and just begin in prayer. Take a response pad from the pew in front of you and just begin to write out what, what the Lord is, is doing and then, and then what you're going to do in response to it. Okay, if you've been charged to get in the gym of godliness, yeah, what, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to go, yeah, right on, pastor, and then forget as soon as we leave? Like, like. Write down, respond to the Lord. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you're carrying a burden, we want to walk with you. Do not walk alone. We walk together as a family. So whatever the Spirit of God has pressed upon you, you be obedient. Would you stand?